Hello, my name is David Ferris, and I want to welcome you to this special edition of the Chamber Buzz. In just a few minutes, we'll be discussing the third and final gubernatorial debate that was held at North Carolina Wesleyan College between Democrat Walter Dalton and Republican Pat McCoy. And I'd like to also today welcome our special guests, Marvin Arrington, uh, Zan Bunn, and Chad Hinton. We had a fourth uh, person who could not make it this morning, and uh, uh, Marvin said that, hey, don't worry about it, I got it under control. Our model was set up to have two Democrats and two Republicans to kind of do something a little different. We're not going to debate the debate. We um, wanted to look in the rearview mirror and see what the candidates pointed out, if there was new, any new ground that was plowed la you know, at the last debate, um, and just kind of talk about things. So, um, again, I want to thank you all for joining us today and thank our panel for coming in this morning. Before we get started, I would like to tell our viewing audience that the opinions and views expressed today do not necessarily express the views of the Rocky Mountain Area Chamber of Commerce uh, or this station. Neither WHIG or myself played any part in the selection of this panel, although I would gladly take credit for it. The idea today, again, is to talk about the candidates' views on various issues and how they relate to the challenges faced in not only North Carolina, but more importantly in our part of the world in northeastern North Carolina and even drilling it down more, the Twin County area. Uh, we've had a lot of hard economic challenges that we've been faced with. Uh, we've had educational issues that we're faced with, and frankly, like the old saying goes, what's in it for me? What's in it for northeastern North Carolina and the Twin County areas? Um, let's get started with a quick statement uh, on how each of you viewed last night's performance. And, and we, we let David Crabtree's toss of the coin uh, at the debate decide that uh, the Republicans won last debate. And so, Marvin, from the Democratic standpoint, how did you think it went last night? Well, uh, as chair of the Nash County Democratic Party, I think our candidate performed very well. He was very specific on uh, the things that he wanted to do for North Carolina, and especially for eastern North Carolina, the area that's most economically uh, devastated by uh, the recession that uh, has occurred over the past uh, few years. And Walter Dalton, with his jobs now and jobs for the future and especially putting emphasis on education and, and balancing the budget in a uh, sensible way that does not take uh, in account for heavy burdens on the middle class. So we think that uh, Walter Dalton uh, emphasis on education, community colleges, and strengthening our skills trade for our community and our workers at this time. Uh, he represented himself very well and we think he will help Eastern North Carolina. Thank you. Zan, Chad, how do y'all feel like uh, Pat McCord did last night? Uh, thank you, David. Thank you for having us today. I think that um, Governor McCord, well, that was a slip of the tongue. Um, the, uh, the reception by Rocky Mount and the Rocky Mount Chamber of Commerce was uh, spectacular. Uh, North Carolina Wesleyan College put on a fabulous a red carpet for all of the people that were in attendance. Uh, the candidates had a wonderful stage on which to uh, debate the issues and uh, talk about the um, matters that are important to North Carolinians. And, and I believe that Pat McCrory did a wonderful job. Um, he responded to each of the issues with uh, authority and with specifics. Um, the, the issue, as we have to determine it, is for the people of North Carolina, uh, which of the two options makes the most sense and which do they want to lead our state for the next uh, four years. Uh, Pat McCrory has done, a, done a, a great job at speaking directly to the people. Uh, he, he relates well. Um, he is a, uh, an experienced leader. Um, he shares some of the stories that uh, his experience uh, brings to the table. And um, we're, we're lucky to have him as our standard bearer. Uh, now, I thought uh, Lieutenant Governor Dalton did a nice job as well. I thought this was one of the best debates. Uh, so it presented a great uh, set of contrasts for voters. 
Well, thank you, and I, I, I agree, frank, frankly, with both of you. I thought it was a good debate. I thought it was, uh, um, as the News and Observer had this morning, there were a few jabs but no knockout, and they basically um, sort of echoed what, what both of y'all have said, that it, it pretty much was a, was a draw. Um, jumping right into some of the questions, I think, that, that are concerned for, for our area of the state, education secondary and higher, math, science, virtual ed, um, accountability, charter schools. Uh, how do we, if, started with Marvin, so I'm going to start over here with, with Chad Zan. If your candidate is elected governor, how does he address the challenges that we have from an educational standpoint? in northeastern North Carolina. There's a huge difference in how a school system in Nash or Edgecombe or Bertie County or Terrell County is handled versus Wake or the Triad or Mecklenburg County. It's just a major difference. Yeah, well, David, I'll, I'll touch on that for just a moment. Um, I felt like Pat laid out a strong vision for some education reforms uh, in the debate this evening and last night, and I believe that uh, several of those points will affect and uh, have benefit to Eastern North Carolina. One thing he said was right now we're operating with a system that has basically four silos. We've got uh, pre-K, we've got K through 12, community college and university system education. He wants to bring those four together working across the board uh, to make sure our students receive the best education possible and have the most resources available to them. Um, something else he mentioned was the use of technology. And I think that's an area that Eastern North Carolina can benefit from when we have low performing schools, we bring in more technology, we can have satellite classrooms, uh, we can utilize the community college and the university resources um, for things of that nature. I, I think charter schools are an option for Eastern North Carolina. Um, you know, our public school systems are doing some things well, some things not as well. And I believe Pat would support charter schools and educational choice for parents to give their students other opportunities uh, to improve their educational opportunities here. Thank you. Marvin, how do you feel that uh, as governor, Walter Dalton could help northeastern North Carolina and the, and the Twin County areas in the field of education and, and, and bringing our, our students up to par with the rest of the state? Okay. Thanks, David. Uh, Walter Dalton, as a senator and as a lieutenant governor, has supported education, education reform, and early childhood education. And Walter Dalton knows the importance of moving our kids very early into our educational system so that they will progress in a way that they will keep up with the times, keep up with uh, what needs to be done to move to the next level. He has invested and has often talked about investment in education. And Walter Dalton, having come from a small town, uh, knows what it's like to have uh, education uh, inequities that uh, Mecklenburg County or Wake County uh, has more funds and more resources than we do down here in eastern North Carolina, uh, Nash, Edgecombe, Halifax County, and Wilson. Uh, we're always struggling. But Walter Dalton, uh, we believe as governor will put more resources into our educational system and there has been no study that shows that the uh, charter schools actually improves the educational system in public education in North Carolina. Uh, charter schools basically takes away from the resources in the public uh, schools and we believe that the limit on those should be uh, set at a certain limit so that public education receives the, the funding that it needs because taking students away from public education will not help with the solution and Walter Dalton will tackle that problem sufficiently. Okay, great, thank you. Did, Zan, did you want to add anything? I, I would like to say that I, I think education 
um, is so important and it, it boils down to the stakeholders. Uh, parents are the most important stakeholders because most parents want their children to have a good education. And there's room in North Carolina for all options. There's room for public schools, charter schools, which are part of the public school system, private schools. Um, if parents have choices and options to, to make sure that their children can receive the education that they deserve, uh, that would make all of our population better. Taxpayers have a stake as well because a question was asked last night, uh, when have we spent too much on education? And that and was can really... Can you spend too much on it? Right, and, and that I thought was uh, uh, a very awkward question because uh, it's not true that more money equals uh, improved results. We, we just need to pay attention to that. I agree. Marvin, on the in the area of education on technology with, with things like iPads, um, laptops seem to be hitting every classroom. Is that a deal changer for us? Does that, does that help our classrooms in, in, in our region where, you know, we're, we're strapped financially more so than the, the major areas? Does that help us with the quality of teachers or, or aids that we can introduce into our classroom that perhaps we couldn't under the old days of, of just hardback books? Well, we all know that technology computers are not going away. They are coming at us faster, and they are getting smaller. They are getting uh, smarter. And uh, bringing those type of resources into uh, eastern North Carolina is going to be very important. And our school system have to uh, have some assistance on how that technology will be uh, integrated into uh, our school system financially. So the computer is going to be, and getting inside the classroom and how we inter, uh, integrate that with our instructional uh, program will be very important. Now, there's also uh, the, the thing of education as far as our skills trade training that uh, we want to do. And we know that it's very important that uh, kids receive uh, proficiency in, in English and math in order to succeed in our skills trade uh, market. Mm -hmm. And Eastern North Carolina, we have a skills trade market that uh, if you're an electrician or a mechanic or uh, say a tool maker, uh, you can make at least $26 an hour. And going into that path, uh, Walter Dalton believed that if we, uh, along with business, move our community college uh, into that area of skilled trade uh, for our uh, citizens that who might want to go into those uh, areas that uh, it be open. But uh, the thing of technology in eastern North Carolina, we will have to find a way to bring our citizens up to speed with uh, technology because it's not going to move away from us. Thank you. And, and staying with you, um, the next question or the next opportunity for comments something near and dear to all of us, taxes. Now, last, at, at this last debate, um, you heard opportunities presented by both candidates for going in two different directions. Uh, we have to realize that we all know we've got to pay uh, something for, for our road systems, for our, our uh, support throughout the state in different areas. One of the, the key differences I saw last night involved incentives and taxes for businesses. Uh, one candidate says, let's lower or remove corporate taxes, let's lower personal taxes, um, we can get more industry in, let's trade off giving incentives, monetary incentives, for less taxes. Um, does the math add up? Uh, you know, you hear criticisms about incentives going to recruit a business, they come in like Dell Computer, they stay a little while and they run for the hills. Um, does that work? Well, David, uh, we have seen some evidence that 
yes, incentive does work. Uh, they don't work all the time, but uh, being competitive in, in the world market, uh, certainly uh, we have to raise the bar as far as our recruitment process and what it is that business really need to enter North Carolina. Now, if incentive proves to be uh, a, a point that will move business into North Carolina, we need to investigate and invest in those incentives. If it's education that, that uh, brings uh, business into our uh, community, the education of our workers, if that's the incentive that mostly brings uh, business towards us, we need to invest in education. If it's water and sewer infrastructure that needs to be uh, improved upon in our area, that's the incentive for business to come in our area. If there are certain incentives about uh, tax breaks in our counties or in uh, uh, our state that needs to be investigated as far as an incentive that would draw business, we can investigate the incentive uh, validity as far as making sure that jobs come into North Carolina and business prosper and don't just leave. Now, so as we move along to our future in, in North Carolina, uh, we must be careful that we don't just get on one uh, side of the fence and say this is the way, hopefully, uh, as Walter Dalton has shown in the past, that he was look at both sides of incentives versus all of the other things that I mentioned that we need to build upon to bring uh, business into eastern North Carolina and North Carolina as a state. Chad, Zan, mm -hmm. last debate, it, it sounded more like um, Mr. McCory was for zero taxes for business and taking the incentives off the uh, off the the table. Um, incentives drive it. Tax breaks drive it. There are other factors, as as Marvin pointed out, that make a difference. What's your take on all this, okay. uh, David? I, your example of Dell is precisely why incentives probably do not work effectively to recruit business. And I know that Pat McCrory wants to create an environment in North Carolina uh, through taxes and other, um, other matters that will lure business here because it's a good place to be. Um, I think there's a perception that Raleigh is broken and there are 99 counties including these twin counties that aren't in Raleigh. And it's hard to explain to a small business owner in Rocky Mount or Tarboro why a large company should receive an incentive, but they're not getting an incentive. Um, so I think the people um, agree with Pat McCrory that we should look at taxes and incentives. And I, I personally would certainly not uh, support incentives, and I, th I think that's an easy explanation to voters. Mm -hmm. yeah, if I could add on to that, David, I think uh, Pat laid out a vision for reforming the tax code and the debate. Um, he wants to modernize the code and work in a bipartisan fashion with our General Assembly to lower the corporate rates, to lower the income rates, and to make the business climate in North Carolina more attractive to new industries and to entrepreneurs starting businesses here. And I think that's a good thing. Um, I think he would offset the loss in revenue by the growth that would be a result of those lower taxes and the increased industry. Okay. Um, when we come back, we're going to uh, we're going to talk a little bit about energy and transportation in the form of I-95 and the tolling or not tolling of it, and also our economic development as well as other other topics. You hear Nationwide is on your side all the time, but why should you believe it? Well, Nationwide Insurance puts their members first because they don't have shareholders. Plus, you can add features like vanishing deductible to your policy and then take $100 off your deductible for every year of safe driving until your deductible could vanish completely. <laughs> Dale. Nationwide is on your side. To learn more about the nation, contact Mary Kay Ruffin in Rocky Mount or call 252-446-2370.
Farrington's Auto Works and Collision Center is a full service repair facility and collision center. Engine and transmission repair or replacement, tune ups, brakes, and air conditioning. We have the latest computer diagnostic equipment and we are an NC inspection station. We also accept extended warranties. Our brand new body shop is a complete state of the art collision center, offering frame straightening, lifetime paint guarantees, and free computerized estimates. We use all BASF paint products that are original equipment on over 80% of today's car manufacturers, foreign and domestic. Visit the only independently owned one-stop shop for complete auto care at Therrington's Auto Works and Collision Center, 1212 Construction Drive in Rocky Mount, and let us take care of all of your car's needs. At Mario's, we do our best to provide you with a delicious meal inspired by Italy, but served to you with Southern love and care. If you're looking for great food and great atmosphere at great prices, come visit any of our three locations. Join us for lunch or dinner at Mario's in the Westridge Village Shopping Center. If you're on the go, visit Mario's too at the EP Mart on North Old Carriage Road. At this location, we serve burgers and sandwiches as well as pizza and Italian cuisine. And if you're in or near the mall, check out Rufino's at the food court. Pizza and takeout at all locations. Call or order in at Mario's at West Ridge Village Shopping Center at 252-451-9393 or Mario's on Old Carriage Road at 252-212-8118 or Rufino's at the food court in the mall at 252-212-8194. Thank you and welcome back. Uh, again, our, our guests today are Marvin Harrington and Chad Hinton and Zan Bunn. And once again, thank you all for coming in on our post-election interviews and, and comments. Um, we've been talking about education and tax. Let's, let's move to what some of our tax dollars go to, or we'd like them to go to anyway. And that's the development of energy and alternative energy. Uh, fracking, probably none of us knew what that word was two years ago, and now mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's a household term. Um, energy, trying to get less dependent on, on fossil fuels, maybe with biofuels, clean coal, natural gas, uh, solar, wind, uh, and fracking, nuclear. Uh, we, we had some conversation at the last debate about fracking in particular. Um, how, does, how does Mr. McCord view fracking and alternate sources of energy, as, as in biofuel, clean coal, and where's it going to come from? Pat McCrory said last night that we have uh, incredible natural resources in North Carolina, and it is the responsibility of our state leaders uh, that would be the governor, um, the council of state, the legislature, to investigate and to put into place all of the uh, processes necessary to determine how and on what time frame, uh, timetable, we can harvest those resources. Uh, I think that um, he, he stated very succinctly that he supports the study and I think he used um, the three to four year time frame of studying the process of getting started um, and ask why we weren't already underway. So I think he staked his position uh, to make sure that we get started to study what possibilities exist uh, because it might uh, lower the cost of energy for North Carolinians and make it easier to do business um, and make it better for uh, taxpayers. Marvin? Yeah. Okay. Um, one thing we got to remember that uh, the Earth, our planet, is something almost like our brain. Once you start drilling inside of it, you don't really know what's there or what nerve you might hit that might cause a rupture. So fracking is one of those uh, energy new experiments that drills deep into the ground and it goes through our water system and a lot of eastern North Carolina still uh, rely on uh, groundwater and we don't want to 
interrupt that natural process that the earth has for us. And that's why it's so important that we study fracking or study offshore drilling because, like I said, our planet is kind of like our brain. We are still exploring the effects of what we do, when we do it, and how we do it. And Governor to be Walter Dalton knows that we must take those precautions to protect our citizens, protect our citizens from the engineering, the business guys that really want to come in and make a quick dollar and leave, and leave us with a destroyed water supply or any other defects that they will not repair. So it's very important that we as citizens support our legislature to make them promise us that fracking, offshore drilling is going to keep our shores safe and keep our water supplies safe so that we will not have the effects of a long-term disaster. Thank you. Um, it seems that both candidates were pretty much together on natural gas, solar, wind, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and nuclear sort of like fracking is, is a little bit on the controversial side. I, I don't think I've heard that addressed by either candidate. So we will move on to what will make people come and go in this state and something again um, that affects eastern North Carolina more than anywhere else in the state. And it's been overlooked for decades and that's a 50 plus year old interstate mm -hmm. that has outused its life as a two lane or four lane um, road. It connects the north with the south uh, Rocky Mount for years was known as a midway point between New York and Miami for what was then referred to as the Snowbirds. That's right. Um, and as a community, we have enjoyed the fruits of I-95 uh, from commerce, restaurants, hotels, uh, purchasing gasoline, and occasionally automotive repairs, or they just stop in and, and, and go to our malls and shopping centers. And it is, it is being talked about now that the only way that uh, I-95 can expand in our lifetime is through tolls. But yet we see I-85, I-40, and others that seem to have continuous uh, construction going on um, with no talk of tolls. A, a point was made, a question was made, I think, by Mr. Crabtree um, that the existing I-95 and tolling it, the fear was it would drive traffic coming north onto I-85, which would completely bypass our area. Mm -hmm. What can your candidate do? What, what are you hearing that they can get I-95 or begin that, that process without tolling? and without leaving us void in eastern North Carolina of any other dollars to go to our highway system. Marvin, we'll start with you. Well, we know that the I-95 corridor is a very important uh, lane of commerce for uh, Rocky Mount, eastern North Carolina, and all the traffic that comes through is very important to our tourism industry and uh, to all the businesses that it affect. And the state and uh, the federal government must come up with a, a plan that uh, will not hurt our local citizens and will not hurt that uh, corridor. And I don't have an exact answer for uh, exactly how that might occur, but the federal, state, and, and local governments must come together, probably as a commission, to uh, evaluate and study how we can best uh, repair I-95 because it's in uh, a very deteriorating state and uh, it's the main line of commerce for our area. And we would not like to put an extra burden of, of uh, tax incentives on our citizens. So uh, at this time, uh, we would hope that uh, there are compromise on an uh, efficient way to refund the corridor with the uh, reach. Thank you. Yeah, uh, David, I certainly understand the problems we have with I-95. I commuted for four years uh, back and forth to college at Campbell University and saw many miles on that highway and it is in terrible shape. Uh, I've had more than one cracked windshield from driving on it. Um, I think this is an area that Pat McCrory and Walter Dalton had some agreement on in the debate. Uh, both were in favor of public-private partnerships, uh, possibly exploring pay-as-you-go funding, um, looking at 
drawing down more federal dollars for the project. Um, something that Pat stated, though, that I found very interesting was um, re-examining the DOT highway formula. Uh, we've got an equity formula that spreads the highway funds across the state evenly, whether various highway districts need the funds or not. And I think he'd like to maybe re-examine that formula, look at a need-based formula, look at traffic congestion, safety issues, and economic concerns, as you were alluding to, David, about the commerce effect that the highway has. And I, I think that total approach is the best way to handle the situation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've talked about Northeastern North Carolina and our economic challenges a lot. How would a Governor McCoy or a Governor Dalton help recruit business and, and into Northeastern North Carolina, and specifically to Nash Edgecombe. Um, with our challenges, we do have a, a good water supply in our area, and it's probably because we're underdeveloped. We're big in agribusiness, which is, which is certainly something we can tie into. But we need jobs. We need to be considered for other opportunities that, frankly, we've been void of in the past several administrations. Um, this does not just go to our current governor, but our governor prior to that. Um, it just doesn't appear that we're getting, <clears throat> excuse me, a much needed hand. How would, again, a governor, Corey, or Governor Dalton help drive business to our part of the state? That's a great question. And that's precisely why Pat McCrory needs to be our next governor. He addressed in the debate uh, that he is the number one salesman for North Carolina. And I can see him uh, now recruiting heavily around the world uh, to, to make sure that our state um, is first and foremost and prominently um, prominently uh, pitched to all the right people. Um, the fact that the debate was in eastern North Carolina, uh, right here uh, in Rocky Mount last night, is proof that uh, the whole state will get attention. Uh, so I think, I think Pat said he will be a good salesman, uh, and that's the way that we're going to, uh, that's the way that we're going to regain some of the um, stability that we need. Um, I'll further call him the number one cheerleader, the number one salesman uh, for economic development uh, for our whole state because we have a very uh, rich and diverse state. Oh. Yeah. Let me remind you that the best salesman in the world cannot sell a bad product. And North Carolina, and that's why Walter Dalton want to improve on our community college, our public schools, the way we retrain workers. That's going to be the selling point for a business that want to come to eastern North Carolina. Sure, you can sell uh, for Wake, Mecklenburg County, but for eastern North Carolina, what are we going to do in the preparation to go out and sell to business how we're going to make them thrive in eastern North Carolina? Like I said, improving on our skills trade with our community colleges, those are workers that make middle class incomes and we want to improve on our public school systems here in eastern North Carolina. They must be strong and viable and integrated with different classes that offer opportunities that business and their family members would like to come and live here in eastern North Carolina with our uh, nice environment, our clean uh, water, and our resources with our uh, reservoir area. So we want to have those incentives so that our future governor, Walter Dalton, can go out and have a product that will be sold and they will buy it. It would be a nice product that says the citizens of eastern North Carolina and North Carolina as a whole are prepared to prosper your business. Let me, let me put one little question on the table or comment and just if you would both just be very brief in your response to it. The last, well, you know, long, longer than that, probably the last uh, uh, 20 years have 
the governor's office has been occupied by somebody from eastern North Carolina, mm -hmm. going back to Governor Hunt. Governor Hunt seemed to want balance across the state in industry and industrial development and so forth. Governor Easley, who was from Nash County, mm -hmm. and Governor Purdue, who is from Newburn, um, that's her recent home, they, in my opinion, <clears throat> seem to have forgotten Eastern North Carolina as far as economically developed. Now, we'll take this thing one, one step further. Both candidates, very qualified, very genuine people, way on the other side of the state. That's right. One in the mountains, one in the great state of Mecklenburg County. Are you comfortable that they're going to remember us beyond the third debate for development? Very briefly. Yeah, I, I think they will remember North Carolina uh, better than the governors from this area. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I've uh, had the you're opportunity. Comfortable, to, you're comfortable yeah. way out west looking at eastern North Carolina. I think North so. Eastern North yeah, Carolina. I've seen Pat visit eastern North Carolina. I've seen him uh, make appearances in Rocky Mount and Tarboro and uh, Williamston, all points east. Um, and to go back to the economy and bringing jobs to the area, one point he did raise was getting into the energy business. And I think there's some benefits there for eastern North Carolina with possible wind energy jobs uh, down at the coast, with possible biofuels jobs, taking advantage of our agriculture in this area. So I, I think Pat's um, stance on the economy, improving jobs, uh, applies to the entire state, including eastern North Carolina, and I look forward to seeing what he can do. Barbara, how do you feel how comfortable, and I'm asking the question, I think that's on a lot of minds in this area. These two folks, you know, they don't live here, they really don't know us, they don't know our challenges, and we're looking at it saying, gee whiz, we had two previous governors were from this neck of the woods, as they say, and you get the sense that they almost tried intentionally not to, not to help us. How comfortable are you with the West not forgetting the East. Well, to address uh, our candidate, uh, Walter Dalton, uh, Walter Dalton, like I said, come from a small uh, town area, and Walter Dalton is not going to forget uh, North Carolina. We're Eastern North Carolina. We're so used to having politicians come to Eastern North Carolina and make a quick visit and go back to Raleigh or go back to the area that they come from. But the way Walter Dalton is not going to forget Eastern North Carolina is talking about education, our community colleges, and giving them the resources to train our workers so that they'll be prepared for these jobs that these companies uh, have. And that's the way Walter Dalton is not going to forget Eastern North Carolina. He's going to try and work with the legislature to try to put the resources in education, job training, and also with our health uh, industry. So the jobs that are out there in, in, in nursing, uh, biotechnology, uh, me the mechanical technical fields are the jobs that he will try to get the resources to train and send uh, his stamp uh, for business and our citizens. So that's the way he's not going to get uh, Eastern North Carolina or the state of North Carolina. Um, thank you. We're, we're kind of winding this down and I had two other questions that really uh, I, don't, I don't know that has been addressed by either candidate. And so I'm going to ask you for your personal opinion on it. But before I do, the, the third debate, I met a young man, uh, Duncan Ricey V, who's nine years old. He's from Terrell County and goes to Terrell Elementary. And Mr. Crabtree did ask one of his questions, and I told him, I said, well, we're going to be on the air, so we'll, we'll bring it back up. So this isn't a question that needs an answer. But I, I think it does reflect the concern that even children have in this day and time. They understand the value of education. His was, how will you keep North Carolina's budget balanced without raising taxes or cutting education? And I think coming from a nine-year-old, the, the value of an education is, is noticed at that level, and the concern for cuts and are we doing the right things is noticed. So I just want to bring that out. The, the two just opinions. Um, you hear so much about the governor's race, and you hear very little about 
Council of State Lieutenant Governor. And it's been asked every now and then, why don't we have the Governor and Lieutenant Governor run together like President and Vice President? Um, just in, in a matter of seconds, uh, Marvin, would you support something like that? Governor and Lieutenant Governor running as a team similar to uh, the President and Vice President running as a team? That's a possibility because uh, right now, uh, when the lieutenant governor is in the opposing party, the, the, the race is always connected like the lieutenant governor is part of the, the ruling party of the same party. So, and there are really no real connect there. So there's a possibility that, yes, we might want to change as, uh, to run as a team because that would indicate to the voters that maybe they uh, are a team and working for the same policies and it would eliminate uh, the false accusation that comes along with, well, because you was a lieutenant governor of the same uh, governor that was in power that you pushed all the uh, policies of that particular governor. So that's something for uh, our citizens to study and to let our legislators know uh, their opinion. How do, how do you feel about it? Yeah. Uh, I'm not opposed to it, David. I think it's probably a good idea. It would save uh, some of our candidates some money. They'd be able to pool their resources and um, mm -hmm. work as a team campaigning across the state. Um, I, I would point out that I think the lieutenant governor is a very important position. Uh, they act as the president of our Senate. Um, our current governor, Bev Perdue, was lieutenant governor and cast the tie-breaking vote on the lottery when it was formed. So sometimes that is a very important position, and it's nice to have a say in who is elected to that post. Zan. Briefly, how, how would you feel about it, personally, not, not from a, a party's stand? Um, I, I agree with Chad. I could go either way, but I can't hesitate uh, pointing out that we have an excellent gubernatorial candidate, Pat McCrory, whose information can be found at patmccrory.com, and we have an excellent lieutenant governor candidate, Dan Forrest, whose information can be found at danforrest.com. Um, in, in, in literally 30 seconds for both sides, super PACs, outside contributions. Again, personally, how do you, how do you feel about it? Well, I, I believe anyone who is a citizen of the United States or a legal entity in the United States should be allowed to give whatever money they wanted to to campaigns, but everything should be reported, everything should be subject to audit, and the people should understand and know where that money is coming from. I think the more, transparency we, the more transparency we have in fundraising, the better uh, for our system. So if I, if I want to contribute as a North Carolinian, I don't know, $100,000 to the Senate race in Arizona, mm -hmm. that's okay? I think as long as citizens in Arizona knew that it was coming from you, I don't have a problem with that at all. They okay. could judge Thank whether or not it was fair to their candidate. Money is speech, and speech is protected under our First Amendment. Okay. And transparency in everything is good. Well, we all have seen in our recent uh, election that uh, Super PACs has a voice that we as ordinary citizens simply do not have. They do not have to report. The transparency is not there. They do not have to report their names or how much they are sending to a Super PAC. So, uh, you don't know exactly who these ads are coming from, and the citizens are getting cheated mm -hmm. because the citizens, when they call their legislature, they are listening to the super PAC, not the citizens that's sitting down here, uh, don't have water coming to his uh, house, or might be against annexation or something, or any issue. So the, the citizens are getting cheated with super PACs, and super PACs should have, be required to uh, have this transparency to list all of their contributions and to where, to whom. Okay, thank you. I'd like to thank our, our panel, um, Marvin, Chad, Zan, thank for you, coming Dave. in today. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your input, your thoughts. And I'd like to remind our viewing audience that voting is a privilege. And it's a, it's a privilege that hundreds of thousands of lives have been lost protecting through the wars. Um, Please don't stand by and, and miss this opportunity to vote. I'm a believer that if you don't vote, then don't complain. But it's an exercise and a right that our country has that is unique in this world today. So we encourage our audience, regardless of your, poly, your, your, your politics, 
your party affiliation, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, Independent, or whatever, get out and vote. And thank you for, on behalf of the Rocky Mountain Area Chamber of Commerce and WHIG.